apologize for starting. Thank you all for joining the um, October 6th special board of directors meeting of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I'm board chair Ashley Stolzman and because of COVID-19 this meeting is being held electronically and being recorded. Um, we also have included tonight, we've added on the uh, closed captioning so uh, folks have a more uh, easy time of hearing and following along if there's any trouble. You can turn that off at the bottom of your panel on the far right hand side there's a, a button that says live CC. And you could just click that and then go ahead and turn it off if you find the subtitles um, distracting. But if you're having trouble hearing, go ahead and turn those on and it should help you out. Um, so I'll call the meeting to order. And um, as always, we'll be moving people over as fast as we can. Uh, if you're a board member and you're in the attendee list, um, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get you moved over as fast as we can. And um, if we're as we're going through attendance, uh, if we uh, miss you, just go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get that all sorted as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Melinda Stevens and ask if she could please do a roll call for us this evening. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I do want to note that uh, John Dyack has had to call in and cannot be promoted to a panelist, but uh, we do know that he is present and able to participate. Uh, all right, and with that, I'll get started with roll. Uh, Aaron Brockett of Boulder. Present. Adam Cushing of Brighton. Chris Giordanelli of Brighton. Allison Coombs of Aurora. Mike Kaufman of Aurora, Anita Seitz of Westminster, Lindsay Smith of Westminster, Bill Gipp of Erie, Sarah Laughlin of Erie, <clears throat> Bill Van Meter of RTD, Bob Pfeiffer of Arvada, John Marriott of Arvada, Bud Starker of Wheat Ridge. Happy to be here. Thank you, Bud. Claire Levy of Boulder County. I'm here. Awesome. Colleen Whitlow of Mead. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. David Spellman of Blackhawk. Deborah Moldy of Castle Pines. Here. Don Cognac of Firestone. David Whelan of Firestone. George Lance of Greenwood Village. Here. George Teal of Douglas County. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Jacob LeBure of Lakewood. Dana Gutwine of Lakewood. Jim Dale of Golden. Here. Jim Kumerly of Lock Bowie. Jamie Jeffrey of Lock Bowie. Jason Gray of Castle Rock. Yep, yeah, here. Thank you. Jeff Baker of Arapahoe County. Bill Holland of Arapahoe County. Jerry Valdez of Littleton. Pamela Grove of Littleton. Jessica Sandgren of Thornton. Julia Marvin of Thornton. Joan Peck of Longmont. Present. John Dyack of Parker. Here. There you go, thanks John. Josie Cockrell of Foxfield. Lisa Jones of Foxfield. We just got Josie promoted over to panelist. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Julie Duran Mullica of North Glen. Joyce Downing of North Glen. Kara Tanucci of Central City. Jeremy Fay of Central City. Catherine Whitman of Decono. Jackie Thomas of Decono. Kevin Flynn of Denver. 
here and I'm enjoying the closed captioning. If no one's watching, it's it's uh, amusing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Christopher Larson of Nederland. Larry Vidham of Bennett. Linda Montoya of Federal Heights. Celeste Arner of Federal Heights. Linda Olson of Inglewood. Cheryl Wink of Inglewood. Lynette Kelsey of Georgetown. Here. Margo Ramsden of Bomar. Michael Hillman of Idaho Springs. Neil Shaw of Superior. Tim Howard of Superior. Nicholas Angelo of Lyons. Holly Rogan of Lyons. Here. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm here, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yes, I can hear you now, thank you. Uh, Nicholas Williams of Denver. Here. Nicole Frank of Commerce City. Craig Hurst of Commerce City. Paul Sutton of Morrison. Here. Rachel Binkley of Glendale. Ryan Toucher of Glendale. Randy Wheel of Cherry Hills Village. Glad to be here. Thank you, Randy. Randy Wheelock of Clear Creek County. George Marlin of Clear Creek County. Rebecca White of CDOT. She's, she's here. We're just moving her over. Okay, thank here. you. Here. Uh, there we go, thank you. Uh, Roy Palmer of Columbine Valley. Gail Christie of Columbine Valley. Sally Daigle of Sheridan. <clears throat> Stephanie Walton of Lafayette. Tim Barnes of Lafayette. Steve Odoricio of Adams County. Lynn Baca of Adams County. Steve Conklin of Edgewater. Here. Tammy Maurer of Centennial. Present. Tracy Kraft Tharp of Jefferson County. Yes. Webb Sill of Gilpin County. William Lindstedt of Broomfield. Here. Wynn Shaw of Lone Tree. Here. All right, great. And then uh, Madam Chair, would you like me to hand it back to you for anyone that we did not mention or wasn't able to? That would be great. Okay. Great, thanks. So if folks could please raise their hand um, if they weren't able to make it through on the roll call. Um, and I see, um, Neil Shaw, can you just test your microphone? Um, I didn't hear you say here, but I see your name in the list and you were on the panel side when that happened. So can we just confirm you can speak? All right, there may be a problem. Um, oh, there you go. All right. Yeah, here, I'm, I'm still here, just having my problems. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I just wanted to confirm that everything was working okay. It seems solved now. Um, so Neil Shaw, Allison Coombs, and Stephanie Walton are all here. Um, I'm chairman. I'm sorry, this is Doug real quick. I just wanted to also note that uh, Director Director Jessica Sangren is on the phone um, and she's still on the on the other side of the wall here. So we're trying to figure out a way to- uh, Okay, no problem. Um, so Jessica, you can dial star nine and we'll see a hand raised um, at any time and, and you'll be able to participate in the meeting just like everybody else. I think I'm on now, Ashley, can you hear me? Yes, we sure can. Okay, perfect, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And um, just making sure uh, that we mark Nicholas Angelo here as well. I see him in the list and we got him moved over uh, during the roll call. Is there, if there's anyone else that thinks they may not have been marked down, go ahead and raise your hand at this time. All right, thank you. And we have a quorum. Um, and just I'll repeat for the folks who came on late, um, we've enabled closed captioning for this meeting. So it's more inclusive. 
um, to everyone to be able to participate, but some people find it distracting. If it's distracting you down at the bottom of your screen on the far right hand side, you'll see a, a button that says CC live transcript. You can click it and you can actually turn off um, the subtitles if you find it hard to pay attention to the rest of the group uh, with those on there. So you can have it if you like it and you can turn it off if you don't care for it. So with that, um, I'll just remind everybody that the Board of direct, uh, Directors is evaluating our executive director right now through a survey that's been sent to your email. And we've had very low response rate so far. So I don't know if that means that Doug is gonna do better than normal on the survey or worse than normal on the survey, but I would encourage everybody to please, please, please turn that in before it's due on the 8th coming up here very shortly. So please turn that in. And um, that brings us to our public comment period. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, we'll allocate time at the end of the meeting. I would request that there are no public comments on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board and we'll start with consent and action items immediately after public comment. Are there any members of the public that would care to comment this evening? Our first member of the public to comment is Martha Rakowski. And Martha, you'll have three minutes to tell us what you'd like to tell us. Um, there we go. You may be muted on your end. Thank you. Okay, I got it. Uh, Martha Ruskowski, um, I live in Boulder. Um, I work for NRDC and I'm working with a coalition of environmental groups that are focused on this greenhouse gas pollution rulemaking. Um, I want to thank you for the attention that you're paying to this rulemaking and the really thoughtful approach that Dr. Cog is taking. Um, we reviewed your proposed recommendations and just had a few comments, four to be exact. Um, one is we're interested, the idea of removing the baseline projections from the rulemaking and putting them into a different forum might have value, but if that happens, we think it's really important that the targets also be adjusted so that the baseline doesn't keep changing without the targets also you know, being linked to the baseline so that we know what we're measuring and we can you know, understand progress going forward. The second is that we would rather that the waiver process that CDOT has laid out not be weakened because you know, this is an important rulemaking, there's legislation behind it, and we don't really want mechanisms for projects to, to come in really easily if they're basically blowing the greenhouse gas budget. Um, the third is that we feel it's really important to have good modeling for these projects across the state. And so um, having that modeling be transparent, be open, be consistent, have it, recognize induced demand to the best degree possible as that, you know, as that um, capability evolves. We think that's important. And the point about consistency is important. We know Dr. Cog's modeling is really robust and sophisticated. I know the other areas may not have as sophisticated modeling, but somehow we all need to be comparing apples to apples across the state. So everybody's on the same playing field. And finally, we have asked CDOT to consider creating a transportation equity framework that would guide this rulemaking and other projects going forward. And we hope that we'll, you'll join us in, in asking CDOT to do that. So those are my comments and thank you for your attention to this. Thank you. Any other members of the public here to provide comments this evening? All right, seeing none, that takes us back over to um, our discussion this evening and to the consent agenda. So there is one uh, amendment on the consent agenda, which would be to add Stephanie Walton uh, as present at the last meeting. Um, so with that correction to the minutes, are there any other comments on the consent agenda? Could I please get a motion to approve the consent agenda as amended? Um, Director Walton. Move to approve as amended, thank you. Thank you. Is there a second, Director Teal? Second. Thank you, Director Teal. Any further discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Thank you, everyone. The consent agenda is passed as amended. And so that takes us to our action item this evening. And we'll be discussing uh, the greenhouse gas transportation planning rule making. It's attachment B in your packet. And I'm going to turn it over to Ron Papstorf, our director of transportation planning and operations, to tell us um, how he synthesized the comments and take us through a very brief update. Director Papstorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, uh, directors. Ron Papstorf, happy to be here again. Um, we have had a number of really robust conversations uh, in reviewing the greenhouse gas, uh, the proposed greenhouse gas rule with the with the board. So I am just going to try to pull up a relatively shorter presentation so we can get into the meat of the um, meat of the recommendations here. Give me one second. Um, Kind of before I get too far into that, I do just really want to acknowledge and thank um, CDOT, CDOT staff. Um, you know, we've we've had a number of really good conversations with them leading up to the preparation of the rule. There's nothing easy about this issue or the proposed rule, uh, but really do really do want to acknowledge the the um, work with with us and other MPOs and other stakeholders in uh, CDOT's uh, work towards um, developing the proposed rule. Um, also, um, a lot of Dr. Cox staff um, worked together to um, get us to this point and spent a lot of time reviewing the proposed rule and thinking about it uh, in, in the context of uh, from Dr. Cox's perspective. So um, under Doug's leadership, um, uh, Brad Calvert, Andy Taylor from the Regional Planning uh, and Development Division, uh, Steve Cook, Robert Spots, Melissa Balding, Jacob Rieger uh, in Transportation Planning and Operations um, really spent a considerable amount of time uh, looking at this. And, and I just want to thank the board. Uh, we've had we've taken a lot of your time over the course of several meetings to discuss this proposal and the rule and just really appreciate um, how the board has approached your discussions around the around this issue uh, to get us to this point. Um, so with that, I'm going to quickly breeze through uh, uh, kind of the goals for tonight. want to want to really remind you a little just briefly on the rule context and, and get pretty quick, quickly to the draft comments that we've prepared for your consideration this evening uh, and leave plenty of time for board discussion and, and direction and, and decision making uh, for us this evening. So a reminder of where we are in the process, we're in that 60 day written comment period that ends on October 15th. So um, this is sort of the last scheduled board meeting prior to the close of that public comment period. This is why we're bringing this decision item to you this evening for your consideration to formulate formal comments to submit to CDOT and the Transportation Commission. The current schedule is for the Transportation Commission to consider adoption of a rule at their November 18th meeting. And then assuming that that schedule holds, the rule would become effective on January 14th. Um, remind you that MetroVision and the Regional Transportation Plan really support the, the goals of reducing greenhouse gas emissions related to transportation um, and our work, um, that this, this rule kind of came out of House Bill 19-1261 that set statewide greenhouse gas reduction goals, which was followed by the Pollution Reduction Roadmap that established pathways to help achieve those targets, again, across all sectors of which transportation is just a piece. Uh, not an insignificant piece, but just a piece. Um, and then this year, Senate Bill 260 that set new requirements for CDOT to develop guidelines and procedures for the department and the state's five MPOs related to transportation planning um, in the context of the greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, again, just quick reminder that applicable, applicable planning documents include regional transportation plans, both adoption and amendments, the CDOT 10-year plan adoption and amendments, CDOT's four-year prioritized plan, which is a subset of the 10-year plan uh, adoption and amendments, and the Transportation Improvement Program adoption in Dr. Cog and North Front Range, uh, not the other three MPOs. Uh, regionally significant projects for the purpose of this discussion, not, not kind of regionally important projects uh, in the context of the TIP, but for, for regionally significant air quality projects for the purpose of the rule and our federal conformity, basically, roadway capacity projects that are one mile in length, uh, one mile long or longer, new interchanges, uh, interchange capacity improvements, new dedicated rapid transit lanes, uh, rail lines or rail line extensions uh, of a mile in length or more and new rapid transit uh, stations. 
Again, Dr. Cog's role in this as the MPO, we have several federal laws and regulations that we're responsible for um, in terms of the regional transportation planning work and, and really um, having effective decision making around important transportation decisions for the region, evaluating alternatives, um, adopting uh, a, a long range regional transportation plan um, and a uh, transportation improvement program. So the work that we do directly related to these efforts, but also other sort of federal requirements that, um, that guide our transportation planning uh, work that we need to fold this important work into uh, as part of that work. Uh, so real quick summary, the, the proposed rule does amend an existing rule that's um, to CCR 601-22. Those are transportation planning process and transportation planning uh, regions. Uh, there's a uh, preamble to that rule, there are definitions, there's the statewide transportation plan, uh, and then how, how amendments to the regional and statewide transportation plans, that's the existing rule. The new, the new rule uh, for the greenhouse gas emission requirements is a new section eight. So there's the planning reduction levels, there's the process for how compliance is determined, there's a section on mitigation measures, uh, there's a section that addresses uh, air, air pollution control division, uh, confirmation and verification of the work. There's an enforcement section, and then there's a reporting requirement uh, that mainly applies to um, to CDOT reporting. So that's the that's the rule components. I want to I want to, and we've talked about a lot of that over the last several meetings. So I want to get into sort of the meat of the recommendation for your consideration. Um, we included in your packet. Um, a, a draft letter that contains these, rec these specific recommendations and some additional uh, discussion around each of them to put them in context. Uh, there's, a, um, there's a proposed rule with markup uh, of these comments included so you could see sort of these recommended changes in the context of the overall proposed rule. Um, and, and before I get too deep into these, I just wanna remind the board that sort of our approach towards this is is recognizing sort of our policy support for the goals of the rule. And we're really focusing on things that we think are important to help clarify language in the rule um, and maximize our ability to be successful within the rule and help the rule be successful so that all of us can, um, can jointly and collectively accomplish the goals uh, that the rule is trying to address. Um, so with that, I think we, we have talked about all of these before. So none of these should be too much of a surprise, but they're, they're, they're a kind of detailed language here. So we do talk about removing the baseline projections from table one. Uh, and again, that's, that's so that as circumstances change, as we get new information, um, that uh, there's an easier path to adjusting those baselines um, over time. And an example of that might be um, you know, the state demographer's office updates population and employment data um, every year, and, and that that those changes in population and employment forecasts can have a significant impact on on travel demand and and travel behavior uh, within the region. And we we think um, kind of if 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 those population and employment forecasts slow down or or go down, you know, we think we ought to be calculating the greenhouse gas reductions from from those new baselines, not from the old baselines that are that are fixed in the in the rule. Um, the the second proposal is um, to um, allow us to consider uh, and include sort of the full spectrum of a plan that is being proposed for adoption, and so not limiting just to those big regionally significant uh, transportation uh, improvement pro projects. Uh, there were those that I referenced before, but other non-regionally significant transportation system investments that are included in the plan. So we have lots of investments around uh, complete streets and arterial retrofits in our 2050 regional transportation plan, for instance, and, and regional bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure uh, network improvements around the region. We think collectively those have will have a positive impact. They are planned investments um, in the adopted plan. And we just wanna make sure that we're looking at the entirety of those planned investments, not just a uh, subset of the investments that are in, in a plan. Um, we um, are recommending that there be some um, um, clarification of the language about 
what we're aiming for in terms of the compliance. The, the rule language refers to comparing um, our model results to the baselines in table one, but what we're really aiming for is the reduction target. So we think clarifying the language that we're, that we're trying to compare that, compare our results to the baseline minus the reduction levels that we're aiming for. So that's really the target uh, reduction that we're, we're looking for. And then the last one on this page is um, to add, um, add language in section 8.02.1 um, so that when we're adopting a transportation improvement program, that the analysis that we do around the emissions, uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to that, to that tip uh, apply to a horizon year that corresponds with the last year of the TIP. So remember that TIPs are a near-term four-year investment plan, not a long-range plan. The rule requires demonstrating compliance with years 25, 30, 35, 30, 40, and 50, sorry, 30, 40, and 50. And since the plan, the regional transportation plan has to go through that compliance demonstration for those out years, when we're adopting a near year, a near term four year tip, we should analyze the tip against sort of the, the nearest uh, horizon year to the end of that tip, rather because if we if we kind of go through the mechanic the mechanics of doing that compliance for uh, 2050, for instance, we will have already done that for the regional transportation plan. And remember that any any project in the tip has to come from and be consistent with the regional transportation plan so it just this is an opportunity for us to reduce the potential to have to do duplicative work that doesn't add any value to to understanding the impacts and ron if you'll just pause for one second so there's a question in the chat about if we're taking questions as we go um, or you know how we're going about this today so i just want to lay that out briefly for the group so people can think about how to um contain their questions and comments. So we are on a really tight timeline because of the rulemaking schedule. And so staff has prepared a letter um, and some attachments to attachment B uh, in the packet. And so today, hopefully we'll be able to come together uh, and decide what the content of that letter should be. Um, so we really need to focus on that. So if people can be thinking um, if they have specific amendments, additions or subtractions from the letter, um, that would really help us be able to get to resolution today. And so um, we'll hold off on questions and comments through the presentation just to get everybody up to speed on what we're talking about, but then also be thinking about what changes, if any, do you want to see to that letter um, so that we can come together and provide meaningful comments on the rule in front of us. So that's the process we have. I'll turn it back to Ron to just kind of keep taking us through at this sort of middle to high level. It's a little not high level, but that's the nature of the beast. And so um, he'll get back through that and then hopefully put up the letter and we'll be able to get into it. Ron, Thank back you. to you. Thank you. Okay, uh, the next two, the next two um, uh, recommended comments um, uh, relate to the, um, the mitigation measures uh, in section 8.02.3. So this, this section requires CDOT to embark on a process uh, completed by April 1st of next year to establish an administrative process to develop mitigation measures and, and how mitigation measures are assessed and, and applied. Um, our recommendation is here that um, we would like CDOT to also develop some guidelines for, for how we do that, not, not just sort of an administrative process, but also that we want to clarify that, that should, we think that should be in consultation with MPO. So it should be a, it should be a very public process, but we want to make sure that it, it really is in consultation with the MPO so that since we're kind of at the front line of uh, complying with the rule uh, in the urban areas. Um, and then some, some minor language changes there uh, just to, to streamline the language, but then uh, really again at how CDOT and MPOs should determine sort of the relative impacts of mitigation measures. And just by reminder of our previous conversations, that's, that really is so it can be context sensitive. Um, you know, some mitigation measures might, might have a different impact in one urban area versus another urban area, or some mitigation measures may be more appropriate in one area than another. Um, and so we just wanna, wanna make sure that, that that is addressed in that process and, and that there's good guidance um, uh, that's worked out between CDOT and the MPOs about how we, how we approach that. Second recommendation on this page is um, uh, about the um, um, how we're going through the compliance process in section 8.02. Um, and, and 
this is about sort of the, uh, if you remember from that process diagram we shared at the last meeting, when we're, when we're evaluating a plan uh, for compliance, um, it, the, the, the proposed rule basically says, if you haven't met the reduction targets, then uh, the MPO utilizes um, um, those funds um, on uh, projects or approved greenhouse gas mitigation measures. And, I, and we, um, our recommendation here is that it can be some or all. We shouldn't be, it shouldn't be an either or. It shouldn't be all or none. Uh, we think there should be some flexibility so that we can use some or all of those funds as we need to on those things that will help reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if we, all, if we don't need to use all of them, but we can you dedicate some of them to additional measures that achieve the rule, then that should be okay. Um, and again, so as necessary to achieve the greenhouse gas reduction levels in million metric tons of um, carbon dioxide equivalents for each compliance year in the table one. So we're just clarifying what we're, what we're uh, aiming for and achieving. And then this is the last page, uh, sorry, the next to the last page of the recommendations. Um, so the next recommendation is to add a provision um, that um, ties more specifically mitigation measures that we think are more appropriate at the project level than at the plan level. Um, and again, the, the things that we invest in in a plan, we think of as really important transportation investments. We ought to be considering that as part of the whole of, of our plans. Um, but when we're doing um, regionally significant roadway capacity projects in a transportation improvement program or a STIP, when it comes time to implement those projects and fund those specific projects in a TIP or the statewide transportation improvement program, that there should be some requirement of the project sponsors for those projects uh, to identify and include appropriate greenhouse gas mitigation measures uh, with those projects so that there are specific mitigation measures tied to that project that may be, that would be in addition to our planned uh, transportation improvements uh, in, in the regional transportation plan or other projects in the TIP. The next recommendation is um, that uh, kind of around the um, uh, enforcement piece in section 8.05, um, that if the commission determines that the requirements of the rule have not been met, uh, that the commission restricts the use of all CMAC, SDBG, and 10-year plan funds anticipated to be expended on reasonably significant projects um, in the area to projects um, and greenhouse gas mitigation measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So that's that's the, uh, because we're recommending changes to that, sorry for the long site here, but 8.02.5.1.1 .1 and 0 0.2, that we can be more specific about what is being restricted and be more direct and clarify that language. Um, the, the next recommendation, um, again, in terms of the enforcement section of the plan um, that um, and an MPO in a metropolitan planning, this is for the waiver, um, that it, it, an MPO in a metropolitan planning area or CDOT and or a TPR, a transportation planning region, those are the, the non-MPO uh, areas of the state um, outside an MPO uh, metropolitan planning area within 60 days instead of 30 days um, of the commission's action that they've determined we haven't been compliant um, can seek a waiver or ask for reconsideration as provided in 8.05.2.1 or 0.2. And the enforcement of the restriction shouldn't begin until the commission has taken action on the request for either the waiver or the reconsideration. And just this bears a little bit of explanation. I'm sorry for the, the markup, but if you remember, one of our discussions uh, previously had been that the proposed language was a little unclear about whether CDOT could seek a waiver for a project in a metropolitan planning organization to the commission without coming through the MPO. And so our, our intent here is to clarify that language so that within an MPO area, um, a waiver has to come through the MPO. So if CDOT wanted to seek a waiver for one of their projects, if it required a waiver, they should work through us and, and those waiver requests should come through, through the MPO. So this just, this is an attempt to clarify that language so that in an MPO area, 
waivers, waivers and those uh, requests for reconsideration need to come uh, through through from the MPO. Um, we're also suggesting that we expend we extend that time frame from 30 days to 60 days. You can imagine that you know that that can take some time to work through the board and and ask the board uh, for um, direction on whether the board wants to seek a waiver, what waivers they might seek, what reconsideration. And so we think 60 days uh, for that for that to play out and to submit that request is more appropriate and, and uh, better to accomplish than than the 30 days. We just we're not certain that we could accomplish that kind of decision just to submit a waiver within within 30 days. And then we were confused by the language about issue one or both of the following opportunities. We don't know what we didn't we weren't clear on what that meant. So we think it clarifies the language to basically just say we can we seek the waiver or ask for the reconsideration. So sorry for the longer explanation there, but um, some more specifics that we hadn't hadn't had a chance to discuss with the board prior. And then this is uh, wrap up the last couple of comments again on the on the waiver piece. Um, we think it's really important. Um, that there is a waiver opportunity, and, and I think there's good rule language about what, what the commission can consider um, and, and how they make that decision on granting a waiver or not. Um, but we do believe that the waiver, should be the waiver should be restricted to regionally significant projects. There's a clear definition for what a regionally significant project is in the context of this rule, and there's a whole bunch of other investments that we plan for in our regional transportation plan or fund through the TIP that are things like travel demand management investments uh, to our tran uh, transportation management associations that we work with that fund really important work to help facilitate getting people out of single occupant vehicles. Uh, for instance, we, we fund important safety improvements that don't add vehicle capacity. They're not reasonably significant from an air quality standpoint, or, but are really important for the region to be able to address of uh, safety concerns um, in, in the region. And we staff does not believe we should have to go to the commission to ask for a waiver for to fund those kinds of those kinds of projects. We should focus the waivers on those regionally significant projects that that really have um, the biggest impact on greenhouse gas emissions and, and, and not have to go through a waiver process in order to be able to fund important investments that that don't really don't that don't increase greenhouse gas emissions. And then the last, um, the last um, comment that we're suggesting is that uh, we strike uh, the sentence from section 8.05.2.3, which is the decision of the commission on a waiver request or a reconsideration request. Uh, the current language says that if no action is taken uh, within that within the time period, and that's 30 days or the next commission meeting, uh, the waiver or reconsideration request shall be deemed to be denied. Uh, we're suggesting striking that language so that the it's clear that the commission the commission needs to act um, on on any waiver requests or reconsideration requests they get. So real quickly, I'll just say that you know this this is not the end of the conversation. Once the rule is adopted, there's a there's a significant amount of effort and discussions that will continue beyond the rule being adopted. Um, so that includes that mitigation measure procedure and guidelines development. We're gonna have a lot of agency consultation and agreements around the model assumptions and making sure that we are consistent in, in how, we, how we assess, do the assessment work um, under the rule, um, to establishing some practice, some good, good state of the practice for how we assess plans around the reduction targets. Um, review of the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation uh, Plan as required under Senate Bill 260. We have to do that by October 1st of next year. So that'll be a, a big effort ongoing um, after the rules adopted. And then we've got the development of the next TIP cycle uh, for uh, the 24 to 27 TIP development that we'll have to take into account this rule. And then lots of ongoing um, coordination and consultation and learning and refinement and, and work. This is, this is clearly not the end. And then finally, just I'll wrap up with just some next steps and then hand it back over to the chair to, to walk through the, um, the discussion on the recommendations. Again, that written comment period ends October 15th. Um, if, if directed by the board and if, if the board approves, um, then we would submit the Dr. Cog board comment letter to CDOT. Um, we've got um, the remainder of the 
uh, nine Transportation Commission rulemaking hearings uh, wrapping up here uh, this week. And then, as I mentioned, November 18th is right now uh, the scheduled date for the Transportation Commission to consider uh, the proposed rule for adoption. So, Madam Chair, I'm happy to hand that back to you um, to carry forward the rest of the discussion. Thank you very much, um, Director Papstorf, and thanks again to staff um, for working so hard uh, on helping us to understand the rules, synthesizing all the information, and giving us all these presentations and information over the last several meetings. Um, so where we are today, uh, we've had a lot of robust discussion from board members. Um, staff has taken the cues from us uh, and from our Metro Vision policy to draft um, feedback to provide to the Transportation Commission on the rule. Um, the feedback is really um, targeted at making the rule implementable at this point. Um, so hopefully everybody has had a chance to read the letter and read through those things that Ron just described to us. If you haven't, it's in attachment B in your packet. And so um, what I'm hoping we can do is if people can frame their comments, um, if you have just outright questions, that's absolutely appropriate. Please don't feel like you can't ask them. Um, but if you could frame your comments in proposed motions to add to the letter or subtract from the letter so that we could take formal votes on them and work through them in an orderly fashion. And then once we get all the amendments to the letter in place, we can vote on the totality of the amendments as a group. Um, so with that, if there are folks who would like to lead off any discussion, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand and, and we'll get through that. So first we have Director Teal. You're on mute. Sorry about that. Give me a second. Let me uh, uh, thank you for framing how the discussion could go with proposed amendments and subtractions. Give me a second on that because I was hoping to ask just one clarifying question. Yes, sir. Um, so uh, question for Ron. Um, Going back to slide number 17, we're still tripping over um, in rule 8.02.1, uh, regionally, region, regionally insignificant, non-regionally significant transportation projects um, being used in the emission analysis. Ron, just one more time, uh, please, uh, if you could, Tell us what that's supposed to mean, because there's part of it that we're reading that as roadway projects, transportation projects that are not regionally significant, but also other investment projects that are non-regionally significant to transportation projects. So um, uh, multimodal investments that are not regionally significant, but also could we have, um, as I think an example was used, uh, land use decisions that would increase density, land use decisions that would increase open space. Please clarify, are those non-regionally significant transportation projects things that could be consideration, considered in 8.02.1? Director Papstorff. Cheers, Tolsman. Uh, Director Teal, um, thank you. The, the answer to your question is no about sort of the land use um, issues. The, the language here is, is intentionally specific to transportation system investments included in the plan. So either included in the regional transportation plan or included in a transportation improvement program, the TIP. The tip. So those applicable planning documents. Um, I, I, from our perspective, um, and I think the way the rule is crafted, those sort of other land use things that that may have a positive benefit, I think those are clearly mitigation measures. Those are outside the bounds of sort of transportation investments that are subject to the rule, uh, right? Those things that are included in a, a in a plan. Uh, so that's why we intentionally wrote this language to refer to those transportation system investments that are included in the plan. So I hope that clarifies that. Director Papstorf, can you expand a little bit on that for folks? Just that it. Why do we want to include those other uh, projects when we're doing the modeling? Sure, um, Chairman Stolzman, thank you. Um, so the the important aspect of that is that the plan, uh, the plan, and the investments that we make as a region um, are much more than just roadway widening projects. Uh, we have planned investments to the tune of 
nearly a billion dollars, for instance, in our in our 2050 RTP that are things like uh, arterial safety improvements that improve bicycle and pedestrian safety. Uh, I mentioned some of the set aside programs like the transportation demand management uh, programs that we fund. Uh, we have signal operational improve, operations improvements that help make transportation more efficient and safer on the transportation system. None of those things are regionally significant, uh, but, but they are really important collectively investments in the transportation system uh, that we have planned for the region. Um, regional, regional bicycle and pedestrian network improvements um, uh, within the context of the active transportation plan that was adopted by the board a couple of years ago and folded into the regional transportation plan. So lots of those other investments that are not, not captured in the definition of regionally significant improvements, um, but are really collectively really important to our goals of achieving a safe and efficient and multimodal transportation system for this region over time. Thanks, Director Pepster. Director Teal. I guess then what's our strategy for including that, for insisting on that inclusion? Director Pepster. Yeah, thank you, uh, Director Teal. So the the importance of including this language is that when we're when we're when we're preparing to adopt a, a, a new regional transportation plan, for instance, you know, it, it we think that it makes it, it makes sense to sort of take into account those other investments beyond just the reason, regionally significant roadway widening projects, um, because those other investments are are helpful to actually helping us achieve. Um, our, our goals of improving air quality and reducing greenhouse gas emissions and providing those choices for, for folks around the region. Um, and, and, you know, we, we work, we assess those through sort of adjustments in the model, because obviously we don't put a, a regional bike path directly in the model and determine how many people bike on that path. But when we look at how much collectively we're going to invest in those facilities in the plan and we've committed to funding those projects and a tip, we can make adjustments in the model to at least account for uh, changes in travel behavior as a result of, of those investments. And part of part of the other part of the importance of this language is from our perspective, those are reasonably those are reasonably committed investments. Those are important investments in the context of the plan. And if we don't include this language, I think our concern is then anything that's not a roadway capacity project becomes a mitigation measure under the rule. And we just don't we don't think in the context of a plan or a tip that those investments are mitigation measures. Those are transportation investments. Mitigation measures really ought to be thought of in the context of you're doing a big project. What are you going to do to help mitigate some of the impacts from that project? So maybe there's additional local street connections across a new freeway corridor or new local sidewalk connections to reconnect neighborhoods in the vicinity of, of a significant project or using, um, using low emission construction equipment with that project. Those are all mitigation measures associated with that project. And we think those, those belong there. The investments that we plan to make in a plan or that we fund in the TIP, we should consider those as transportation investments. Okay, that answered my clarification question. Thanks, Ron. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Director Teal. Director Levy. Uh, yeah, thank you. So um, I, have, I have a comment on this provision that we're on right now. Um, I didn't organize my comments per the letter, I did per the slide. So. Uh, I think what I'll do is just is just follow up on that provision that Director Teal was asking about, and um, that that language that you're proposing to add, I, I think is is good. I support that, but I wondered um, if we delete other um, and and either say all or just have nothing. So it would be and. Uh, all or uh, you know non-regionally significant transportation system investments, um, whether that would allow uh, just a more holistic um, analysis uh, of all of the improvements that are proposed because, and I think we've, th this has been the subject of discussion at previous meetings that um, non-regionally significant 
investments could be included for purposes of showing a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, but there may be others that would increase. And so in order to avoid cherry picking and really have a, a, a better, a true picture of, um, of, of what is going to be constructed and included in the plan, um, I guess I would propose we take out that qualifier of other, uh, and I'm, I'm not really sure what that means, and, and in, instead say all uh, non-regionally significant transportation system investments included in the plan. Director Papsdorf. Yeah, um, Madam, Madam Chair, Director um, Levy, I, I think from my perspective, I think it, it would be fine to strike the word other from the clause um, if there's con concern. I think the intent is that we're going to assess the non regionally significant transportation system investments that are included in the plan. And so um, I think striking other is, is, a, is a good clarification. It was, it was, there, was, there was no intent here to try to game a system. We're just trying to more holistic, kind of give us the opportunity to more holistically um, assess the entirety of our plan. Okay, I, I appreciate that. Um, I appreciate that. And could I, could I, um, uh, Chair Stolzman, ask another question here, um, just on these first couple of sets of recommendations? Um, I did want to just follow up on uh, Martha Rostowski's um, suggestion or question about if we move the baselines into a policy directive. Um, if I understood her comment. Um, do we also need to uh, allow some mechanism to adjust the targets? Uh, Director Pepster? Um, our, our recommendation is, is not to do that. The reduction targets should be the reduction targets, um, and they're, they're, they're really aggressive. Um, and, you know, we should be aiming for a reduction. We, th we think the baseline, the things that affect the baseline can can certainly change. And we just, we want a little bit more of a, a reasonable opportunity to sort of review and adjust those baselines as appropriate over time. And obviously that that's only gonna happen in consultation with CDOT and, and with the Transportation Commission. We're not suggesting eliminating the baselines. We just wanna have a little bit better uh, opportunity to, to adjust them as necessary uh, without having to kind of open up this, this long laborious rulemaking um, uh, rulemaking process. So I, I think at least the, the staff recommendation would, would be to, to um, stick with the, stick with this recommendation. I, I understand, I understand the point. Director Levy. Yep. That, that, I think that makes sense. I understand that. So what we are left with is the reduction targets alone that would be codified in the rule. Correct. Can, can I ask a clarifying question while we're on that? Um, Director Brockett, I would rather we go one at a time. If you can just put a pin in it and please don't forget, please note it down. Um, I just, we really need to get through by um, 5.30. <laughs> so it's gonna be tough. Director Levy. Oh, oh thank you, Chair Stolzman. I was going to defer until later if we're working through uh, this in order. Um, okay, great. Um, Director Shaw. Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to say thank you to Dr. Cog's staff for these really thoughtful changes. And thank you to CDOT for being a, a good listener and a good partner in making these changes. Pretty much everything that was suggested uh, by staff and um, uh, liked by the board uh, last time we met has been incorporated. So I appreciate that. Uh, I am certainly in support of the letter. Uh, the City of Lone Tree had sent some separate items for uh, consideration, but in hearing the narrative around 8.02.3 from Ron Papsdorf, I think some of those are um, really have been addressed and uh, one was also submitted through the RAC. So um, I would simply say I am in favor of the letter, including the uh, other, the striking of other and changing to all suggested by Director Levy. Thank you. Thanks, Director. Uh, Director Brackett. 
Uh, thanks, Chair Stolten. My uh, clarifying question was, so uh, just to be clear about when you were asking if the baselines be moved into a separate document, uh, the, tar the numeric targets, you're, you are not saying would shift if the baseline shift, right? So if the reduction target is 0.7 and the baseline shifts a little bit, the reduction target would still be a reduction of 0.7 million metric tons. Is that correct? Uh, that's Captain. correct, Director Brockett, yes. Okay, great. Um, so that was my question. And then, uh, Ashley, should I make a comment Please. here? Or, okay, great. Well, I'll, I'll echo uh, Director Shaw's uh, thank you to staff for your incredibly careful and thoughtful work on this. I think you've done an extraordinary job in, in parsing through a very complicated topic and really appreciate the thoughtful uh, change suggestions from the comment letter. Uh, I want to particularly uh, thank you uh, for being responsive to, to some comments we've made about the keeping the tip as an applicable document. I thought your uh, approach there made a great deal of sense about just give us a formula for how we can you know, bring the tip cycles into alignment with the goal years. And so I think that's a great way of approaching that. So thanks very much for that. Um, <clears throat> so I just had a couple of possible um, additional amendments. I'm very much in support of the letter, um, but just a couple possible additional amendments. I just wanted to hear from a quick staff response, see what you think. Um, so one of them would be uh, to ask that um, CDOT include all MPOs in the 2025 year, uh, rather than just ourselves and the North Front Range MPO. Um, seem, I, I get that they're not as far along with their analysis, but it seemed like a, from a regional equity standpoint and also from the need to address greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as possible, that that would be a not unreasonable thing for Dr. Cog to ask of CDOT. Um, Steph, would, would you mind giving me your Dr. thoughts? Patrick? Um, thank you, Chair Solzman, Director Brockett. Um, I, I, I guess I think that's a, I think that's an appropriate discussion and decision by the part of the board. I think as staff, I, I don't believe that we have an opinion on that issue. Uh, it does not address. It does not directly affect us. Uh, we're focused on those comments. Um, on the rule that helped clarify the rule for our operation within that. I think the decision about whether, whether and how it applies to the other, the other three smaller um, MPOs for that 2025 um, horizon year, um, I think is, is beyond sort of my comfort level as, as your staff to, to speak to. But I think if the board, if the board feels strongly about that, I think that's, that's, a, that's an appropriate board decision. Director Brockett. Uh, thanks for that, Director Habster, if that makes a lot of sense. So I, I'll just, I'll put that out there for the board's consideration. Um, so just happy to go with the will of the board on that one. Um, and I've got one other one, actually, should I Please. say that? All right I'm, I'm noting them all down and then we'll, we'll take notes on them and the order they come in. Great. Um, so the other one is that, uh, you know, that how the modeling is conducted is going to be incredibly important, right? We've talked about that a lot. And so uh, the thought about including in our comment level, something to the effect that, um, that, that we agree that, or we urge CDOT to make sure that the modeling is um, kind of composed and performed with uh, full transparency to, to both uh, with the MPOs and with uh, the public, so that it can be understood and evaluated by uh, all interested parties, and um, also to confirm that uh, the modeling would account for uh, induced demand um, in those models. Director Papstar? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I think I'm, I understand where you're going, Director Brockett, and I think that transparency is is sort in the rule. I don't. I certainly have no objection ever to to increase transparency and and sharing information. I think there's there's good language in the rule about consultation among the agencies. It's very similar to what we do now with our federal partners and other partners around our federal air quality conformity determination. So none of that gives me, gives me any pause. Um, and, I, and I understand the comment about induced demand. Um, you know, our, model, our, models, our models account for sort of induced demand. When you add a new project, the model reacts to that new project and travel patterns change, which is, you know, uh, kind of is, is, an assessment of induced demand. So um, I, I don't have I don't have any I don't have any concern with uh, if there's if there's other um, kind of narrative language that the board wishes to add to the add to the letter that speaks to sort of that that consultation process and and the transparency of that consultation process. Director Brockett. 
No, thanks for, very much for that, Director Papstorff. So that, that makes sense to me as well. So hearing no objection, I, I just would put that out there as well for the board's consideration, see what the role of the board is. Director Brackett, can you just sort of um, capture that, the concept again, just so I get it down correctly? Uh, so that, that, that we request that the, uh, that the, the, I don't know how to, Director Papstorff, how would you say, what kind of models are they? What's the right term to call them? Well, I mean, the, look, the, the moves model, the, remember from our previous conversations, there's, there's the travel demand model that, that, um, that estimates travel patterns and, and travel demand and how, how the transportation system operates as a result of that travel demand and those travel patterns. And then the outputs, the outputs from that model become inputs to the emissions model, which is the moves model. Um, we have we have no control over the moves model. That is that's that's a that's a that model is uh, developed by the federal government. It's managed and applied by uh, CDPHE, um, and so I, I think I think that uh, what you were what you were I think if I understand you correctly, what you're looking for is that we want to suggest. Um, um, addressing in the rule oppor uh, opportunities uh, during that consultation process for increased transparency and reporting of the model assumptions. Yes, that's very good. Thank you. And then with uh, the addition to say, so that it can be understood and evaluated by all interested parties. And is that good, Ashley? Yep, so I have increased transparency during the consultation process so that the public may fully participate. It increased transparency uh, uh, so that the models can be understood and evaluated by all interested parties. Thank you. And, and that the mo uh, to ensure that the modeling um, adequately accounts for induced demand. I'm writing as fast as I can, thank you. Thanks so much, appreciate it, Chair. Um, next, we have Director Mulvey. Yeah, hi, sorry, had to get um, seen and stuff, so apologize for that. Um, I'm a little concerned, it wasn't my planned comment, but I'm a little bit concerned about references to induced demand and um, the references to evaluation by the public because they're, um, they're a little bit nebulous when we're talking about modeling and policy making, which are not often left to the public. Um, they're really more often left to policy making bodies. So while we would involve the public and stakeholders, it would concern me if it's pl placed in the rule. Um, so we would always have the input of stakeholders I would be a little bit concerned about placing it in the rule, much like you might not want to put something in bylaws or something like that. The concern about induced demand is also amplified because it's a term that um, I don't know is really defined by a statute. I know it's in some of the statutes, but I don't know if it's really defined in a way that can be used in this context specifically. So that's my comment on that. Um, my concern about my question has to do with section in the letter, the change to section 8.03 on the adding provisions to require sponsors of regionally significant roadway capacity projects, et cetera. I wanted to see clarification that it's really just to add that that would be added to require those mitigation measures, but not to be listing those mitigation measures themselves. And would we be suggesting that somebody that this rulemaking specify what the mitigation measures are, or would we be asking that CDOT or the MPOs or both determine what the mitigation measures are? Director Pastor. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, Director Mulvey, no, the, 
the rule would not specify those mitigation measures. It would be up to the project sponsor and the and the language, the the kind of language in our comment is is for the project sponsor um, to identify and include those mitigation measures um, when the project and and only when the project is included in the tip. So when it's when it's actually funded. Uh, through the TIP, that's when a project sponsor would identify those appropriate mitigation measures with that project. Thank you. And um, so then as a follow-up question, it wouldn't be in um, any other methodology that would require scoring. And then as a further follow-up, we wouldn't be making a determination on how something would be scored at this juncture with respect to mitigation measures, right? Um, score, Director Mulvey. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to extrapolate a little bit what I think your, your comment is speaking to sort of when we are evaluating um, uh, kind of funding submittals through the Dr. Cog tip process. Um, okay, so I'm getting ahead nod. Thank you. Um, you know, we have we we have some some feedback from the board and some direction from the board, and we've had conversations with the transportation advisory committee about ways that we can improve. Uh, we have always considered sort of air quality impacts of of projects that are submitted for funding through the Dr. Cog tip process, and we're we're uh, engaged in conversations about how we can even do that better, right? Do that do that more transparently. Do that better. Um, and so those conversations are going on. I, 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 I think that there may be a role for um, kind of thinking about what mitigation measures a sponsor might propose with their project when, when considering it for funding and, and, and appropriate uh, kind of what mitigation measures are appropriate to the scale and the type of projects that's being proposed for funding and, and what, what should be included. Um, so I think there's an opportunity there that can help all of us, and I, and I think would 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 be appropriate. Um, I think the guy. What's really important. What's really going to be important is that that work that has to be completed by April first of next year. Again, we hope in consultation with MPOs and 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 CDOT working together to sort of get a better menu of sort of um, guidance about how to look at those mitigation measures. What mitigation measures might be appropriate. So. Um, and that's, that's, that's what we're trying to get at with this language. I would agree that it's a discussion down the road that's important. And I will thank you for that. My other question had to do with um, section 8.05 enforcement and clarification. Um, it looks as though with respect to the changes suggested for 8.05, Point two, you include CMAC, STBG, and tenure with the regionally significant. And then under 8.05, 2.1, they're not included. So I'm wondering if we might, if they should be this consistent. And then the second question is, as to the latter, the 8.052.1, why on that one would we not want to include the non-regionally significant? Director Baxter. Um, Chair Salzman, Director, Director Mulvey. So on the on the second bullet on the screen, I did pop it up just to help with the conversation. I hope that hope this helps. Um, so I, you're speaking to the second bullet, um, which is the enforcement piece, the, the one of the key enforcement um, sections of the bill uh, or the, the rule 8.05.2. The current language says that um, if the commission determines that the requirements have not been met, then the commission shall restrict the use of funds pursuant to 8.0. 2.5.1.1 or 0.2, whichever is applicable. And again, I will just go, let's see if I can find that one. So the, the last bullet on this page speaks to that. So that's why we're proposing to change that other language. These two, these two pieces sort of need to work together. So our suggestion on this section uh, in the compliance piece is that, you know, we should be able to we should be able to kind of at our discretion as an MPO direct some or all of those funds CMAC um, and or and or STBG funds 
um, on those types of projects and um, mitigation measures that will help us achieve the target, right? Because ultimately what we want to do is adopt a plan that achieves the targets. Uh, we hope we don't get to this, this point where we have to do this, but if we have to specify and basically self-restrict a portion of those funds, it should, we should be able to do only a portion of them to the extent that we need to, to achieve the targets. We shouldn't automatically have to restrict all, dedicate all of those funds to those things. So that's the proposed change here. Um, by making that change, that necessitate that necessitates the change to 8.05.2, which is the enforcement mechanism, which currently refers to that previous section. But if we're changing that previous section to give us a little bit more discretion, um, so that we can meet the meet the reduction targets, then here, if even after that we haven't met we haven't met the targets, then the commission, um, the enforcement mechanism is for the commission to restrict all of those CMAC. SDBG funds and tenure and state tenure uh, tenure funds um, that are that would have been expended on reasonably significant projects. So that's that's how those two pieces relate to each other. Great. And so then my question is, why would we not allow for a waiver under 8.05 2.1 for CMAC STBG and tenure as well? So the, the, the waiver applies if, if the commission has made that determination and, and all of those funds have been restricted, then uh, this recommendation is that if we wanted to seek a waiver or, or, a, or, a, or, a, recon, or a reconsideration or a waiver, a waiver for the restriction of those funds, we think we should only have to ask for a waiver for those recently significant projects. So again, if there's if there's a an arterial uh, complete street retrofit project that's basically um, adding transit infrastructure and bike ped facilities um, in that corridor, those clearly are not reasonably significant improvement projects under under the definition of reasonably significant. Right? They're not adding vehicle capacity. We don't believe as staff that we should have to go ask the commission yes. for a waiver for those types of projects. We should only have to ask the commission for a waiver if we think there's a really important, reasonably significant capacity project um, that, that, we, that we still think is important enough for whatever other purpose, we should have to ask for a waiver for those, but we should not have to ask for a waiver to do a safety project, uh, invest, invest those funds in a safety project that does not increase capacity or to, to fund the TDM program or um, to do a regional, to do a um, bike ped project, right? I mean, we just should not have to ask for a waiver for those things. So I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, does this provision, is it a have to or allow? Like, a, you know, do we, do we wanna, by not including, by not including these other things, are we saying that we are my we'll view be, is that, I, yeah i lost you for a second sorry you're back now yeah my i got this unstable internet where i am um anyway my my question is and my point is is that we should be able to ask for a waiver on all of these because we never know what we're going to need and Director, we, Sorry. I, I think Director Mulvey, I think what um, Director Papsdorf is trying to say is there are some projects that we shouldn't have to go through the waiver process on. Like, so they should be exempted from the waiver process. They shouldn't be required to go stand in front of transportation and ask for, they should automatically be exempted. I think, I think, I think Director Mulvey, what we're, what we're trying to say with this refinement is that if, if you read the proposed language, you would have to ask for a waiver for any project that's not expected to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So if there's a safety project that doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but it doesn't increase greenhouse gas emissions either, you would have to go get a waiver for that to be able to invest in that project. And our suggestion here is that those types of projects that don't increase greenhouse gas emissions, but may not reduce greenhouse gas emissions, we should not have to go ask for a waiver from the commission to do. So I think I think the language is consistent with what you're intending it to, to be. 
Yeah, and, and that's the clarification I was seeking. So I, I do very much appreciate that because um, there's a lot of words here. And even though I'm decent with words, I appreciate that. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for, for getting that clarification for all of us, Director Mulvey. So let's um, vote on the ones that have come forward so far, and that'll give people a moment to collect their thoughts so we can add a, additional um, um, amendments. And so I'll just note down that I have Director Levy and Director Pfeiffer in the queue. Um, and so if everybody could just lower their hand for a moment in case we need to um, use our hand raise feature for the voting. Um, so the first uh, amendment that was proposed uh, that we'll be voting on, so everybody pay attention, we're going to be voting, is to replace the word other with the word all on page two of the letter in the underlined section that references 8.02.01. Is anyone confused about what the proposal uh, or proposed amendment is? All right, seeing no confusion, um, all of those in favor, please uh, click the raise hand button. All right, uh, so we have well over half, um, almost everyone. Um, and so I know there's a couple of people on the phone. You can dial star nine uh, to raise your hand if you wanna participate in this. Um, if uh, there's any um, discussion from folks uh, that are in opposition, please, um, now if everyone could please lower your hand. Thank you very much. This is an exercise in our ability to use Zoom. Um, if there's anyone in opposition, please don't feel shy. Um, it's really important to have all voices heard around the Dr. Cog board table. If there's any concern with this um, proposal, please raise your hand and let us know what you would like to tell us. Director Williams. Apologies, still hand. No problem. No. Director Odoricio. Same thing, sorry. It was no problem. from the prior vote. No problem at all. And if anybody um, would like to speak about it, that's great. And otherwise we'll include that as an amendment. All right, seeing no opposition, uh, the next one we have is to ask to, uh, to basically add a statement. And we do not need to wordsmith these things around the Dr. Cog table. The, the Dr. Cog staff will write it in a grammatically correct legitimate way. Uh, we just need to all understand the concept we're voting on and then the Dr. Cog staff will find the appropriate place in the letter. They'll make sure things are capitalized and punctuated and grammatically correct. So please don't make any comments about that. And then the concept that we're voting on is ask, is adding um, an ask of CDOT to include all MPOs uh, in the 2025 year in the table one targets. So the concept here is that right now CDOT Dr. Cog and North Front Range are the only ones being asked to comply with a target for 2025. And so the concept would be that everyone statewide should have a target for 2025, not just uh, the larger areas. Um, is everyone clear what this amendment would be? Is there any concern or question about what the amendment is? All right. All, of, all those in favor of adding the amendment, please raise your hand. And again, we have well over half already raising their hand in favor. And I sincerely apologize for kind of this rushed method of delivery uh, because it doesn't allow full debate like we have, but we are on limited time. So I appreciate all, what everyone's doing. And so if everyone could please um, lower their hand. And then if anybody would like to speak against it, again, please don't be shy. Um, there's lots of different perspectives around the table um, and it's absolutely fine to have a variety of thought. So if anyone would like to speak against this suggestion, please raise your hand. All right, so seeing that we'll include that amendment. And then the next to discuss um, would be to add a statement to encourage CDOT to increase transparency during the consultation process so that the models can be understood by interested parties and that the model captures induced demand. Um, is there any question about what this topic is? And so we would be adding this uh, statement to the letter or something similar that staff crafts that's grammatically correct. Is there any question about what we're voting on? Director, uh, sorry, I was too fast. All right, all of those in favor of adding it, please raise your hand.
Uh, it's still well over half. Uh, if you could please lower your hands. And again, please don't be shy. I know we all um, are better at this in person, but if anyone has a dissenting view on this, please raise your hand. Director Mauer. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to thank Director Brockett for bringing this up. I had this concern as well about the MOOS modeling. So thank you. Oh, okay. Very good. Thank you. Um, so it looks like we'll include this one as well. Uh, and that is what I have so far. And so we'll go back to hands in the queue uh, for other amendments that folks would like to propose. Uh, Director Mulvey, did I miss one of yours? No, thank you. Ms. Okay, just, just making sure. Um, and so uh, next in the queue is Director Pfeiffer and then Director Levy. Thank you, Chair. It's been a while. I've been quiet. You have been. Welcome, Director Pfeiffer. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm pleasured to be with such great people of the region. Um, actually, I want to go back to Ron's comments. I, I really need clarity because I got a lot of comments from my, my uh, team here at the uh, City of Arvada around really the section uh, 8.03, the measurement requirement inside. And I just want to make sure I heard, I think uh, Director, is it Moldy, I think was asking a question about scoring that I don't know if we need to bring that up here. And I, I don't know if I really heard the answer from Ron, but you know, my team is a little concerned that if we don't identify the, the measures and what we're gonna do in the, in, the, in the upfront process, that that will get deemed because like for my community, I don't have interstates and huge highways and infrastructure that have significant impacts to the greenhouse. So would we be disqualified and I, I didn't, Kind of hear an answer around that. So I don't know if Ron wanted to elaborate. Director Papstar, please. Uh, Chair Salzman, Director Pfeiffer. Um, no, it's not a it's not a matter of ding. I think the the intent here is that if a project if a reasonably significant project, so those those capacity and those capacity expansion projects are going to be included in, in in a in a tip or the statewide transportation improvement program, that the project sponsor should be required to identify and include appropriate greenhouse gas mitigation measures as part of that project. So as I said, first, first of all, I wanna remind the board that when we develop the TIP policy for the development of the next TIP, the evaluation criteria, all of that goes through TAC, it goes through the Regional Transportation Committee and ultimately gets approved by the board. So the board, so nothing here related to this language and the rule um, locks the board into any future decision about the evaluation criteria for those for those TIP projects. I think what we're suggesting here is that if we're going to consider um, funding one of those projects in the TIP and including that project in the TIP, the project sponsor should 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 identify and include appropriate mitigation measures. And again, I, I understand a little bit of the the tension that there's uncertainty around that because that that process that CDOT has to, has to engage in after the rules adopted and by, by April 1st, we don't, we, can't, we don't know what the outcome of that process is gonna be, but our intent is, and, and one of the reasons we're including language that we want that to be in consultation with the MPOs is so that we have a strong influence over the, over the outcome of that and good guidance about what are appropriate mitigation measures and how can we sort of consider mitigation measures and, and apply them appropriately. Yeah, and I would just encourage the board and who knows who will be here when we start having those tip discussions again. But, you know, there's been this one word I always heard, which is what is considered, you know, equitable for our communities. And so when we think through uh, this type of measurement that needs to be implemented, uh, it may not be equitable for smaller communities or larger communities. It just depends. And I think we need to be very um, thoughtful when we get to that part, um, I know I might be going a little bit beyond what you're asking here, but it, it is a stepping stone into a direction that worries me. And so I just wanna make sure that when we talk about uh, mitigation measures that it's equitable for, for the project and the community, that makes sense. Uh, hopefully that makes sense for some of you that are understanding. I, I just, I've gotten a lot of emails from my team around this and it worries, it worries my team. Thanks so, Director Pfeiffer. Thank you. Director Levy? 
Yeah, thank you. And I realize now uh, the error of my ways in not um, putting all my comments on the table. Um, so I'm gonna, I've got really two main remaining comments that I, that I wanted to put out there. And uh, on the first one, I don't have any language here, but um, on, you wanna add a provision, uh, which I agree with in section 8.03 to require sponsors of regionally significant roadway capacity projects to identify include mitigation measures. Um, that makes sense and I support that. Um, you know, one of the reasons I, I had advocated to have a BMT reduction target, um, in addition to the fact that a lot of this just the modeling and the assumptions and the cost benefit analysis seems to be based on um, on an assumption of VMT reduction was that that is one way to have uh, to hopefully have some investment in disproportionately impacted communities. And I understand that VMT reductions really aren't going to be workable and I'm not going that direction, but I, I want to suggest that we have some language as an alternative that would require um, that um, some amount, and I'm just going to throw out 25%, of the spending on mitigation measures would go to disproportionately impacted communities. And, and that way, when, when mitigation measures are proposed in order to meet greenhouse gas reduction targets, those mitigation measures, which typically do, you know, they, they you know, if they're gonna help us get there, they're gonna improve air quality, they're gonna improve mobility, they're going to improve multimodal improvements in a community, and and if we could could direct those to DI communities, I think that would help bring more equity to this process. Uh, and I I don't know whether the place to put that I well, I think it is in maybe section eight point oh three. So that's. That's one. I'm just going to, the, the other is, uh, before I get your response or your reaction to that, Director Papstorf, um, is on the, um, the uh, waiver uh, provision 8.05.2.1.2, where it, it's got language um, about, let me get the language right in front of me, um, about substantial, uh, let's see, in no case shall a waiver be granted if such waiver results in a substantial increase in greenhouse gas emissions. We don't have that defined here. And I would like us to strike substantial um, because I think that opens too wide a door and that we, um, that there shouldn't be a waiver if we're going to increase greenhouse gas emissions. We've got tools, mitigation measures um, to address that. And so that would be my second um, comment and, and request. Director Levy, just for my note purposes, do you have a page number or could you repeat the uh, section number for the board substantial? Uh, yeah, it's, um, and I'm looking at the original rule that I got, so I don't have a page number for you. 8.05.2.1.2. Thank you. Director Papstorf? Um, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Director Levy, I'll, I'll speak to the um, mitigation measures um, first. Can I, may I ask you a question? Please. I want to understand the suggestion. So what if what if the project, what if the recently significant project? So this could be this could be an arterial lane while adding adding a lane in each direction to uh, an arterial in Boulder that is kind of an underdeveloped two lanes for a rural arterial, but there's planned planned development in rural county in 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 Boulder County, and the plan is to widen that arterial to add a through lane in each direction. Um, but but the surrounding community, the, the the location of that project is not in a disproportionately impacted community. So you're suggesting that Boulder County, say for instance, is the sponsor of that project, you would have to do those mitigation measures somewhere else. Yeah. Um... And, 
yeah, that are when we present that project that we would propose uh, as part of that project that we would propose mitigation measures that would um, um, benefit uh, DI communities within Boulder County. And okay, what if what if the local sponsor was a community that did not have any disproportionately impacted communities within its within its jurisdiction? I would have to look at the CDPHE um, equity map. Um, so I don't. I, I is that are there communities that have none? I don't know. Um, <laughs> I think it's possible. I think it's possible, but I don't know. And I'm just I'm just trying to think through the implications of your yeah. suggestion. I'm not I'm not saying I'm opposed. I'm just I'm just trying to it, on the fly. I'm just trying to think through the potential implications of that suggestion um, and kind of the the balancing act because I, I you know I understand the intent behind it um, and 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 I get that. I think the 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 thought process I'm just trying to go through is. Do you do you want those mitigation measures to really be associated with the particular project that's that is proposed to be included in the in the tip so that it's so that it truly is sort of offsetting any potential impacts from that project in that area? And I and I just and I'm just have well, to think through if if there if the project it, it, the potential the potential outcome could be and again I'm, I'm not sure but the outcome could be you're you're asking a project sponsor in a community to do mitigation measures outside their jurisdiction where they may not be able to that would not be the intent and i appreciate the question sure. that you're asking so that would not be the intent um so i you know i think it's a um it's an attempt, it's an effort to um, bring greater equity to this. Um, there's a requirement in the rule to describe um, how the mitigation measures will, um, let me find it, description of benefits to disproportionately impacted communities. Um, I, you know, the answer could be none. <laughs> and and that I don't I don't think that would be a good outcome. So I um, I think what the the proposal and I'm you know I don't have language and I wish I did uh, and I realize that's um, that's my problem. But that um, that we have some way to assure that there are investments um, in DI communities. Um, I also do agree with your, you know, with your um, suggestion that mitigation measures um, need to be associated with the project and not be uh, outside that project. Yeah, and, and personally, like personally, I, I very much share the the interest in sort of in, in making sure we're more intentional about um, improving equity in terms of our transportation investments. Um, and, and so I have a personal commitment to that. And if that we're, we're working on ways to do that at Dr. Cog, and um, I think there's there are good opportunities as we engage in conversations around the next tip policy about how we assess that and how we how we encourage more transportation investments that benefit disproportionately impacted communities and improve equity in our transportation investments. Director and, Levy. That are, that are outside the bounds of this rule. Yeah, okay, well, then let's maybe let's make sure we have that conversation there. I think the other one is more concrete and easier to um, to discuss and that is removing substantial um, um, 8.05.2.1.2. I've popped that up on the screen if that's helpful. So this is this is 8.05 is the enforcement mechanism. This is uh, nested under 8.05.2.1, where um, where um, the 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 request of the waiver uh, uh, through the commission and um, the commission may waive the restrictions on specific projects on the following basis, so that they determine that um, the um, the transportation report reflected significant effort and priority placed in total on projects and mitigation measures that reduce emissions. And in no case uh, shall a waiver be granted if such a waiver results in a substantial increase in greenhouse gas emissions when compared to the required reduction levels in the rule. So I think I, I, I don't disagree with you that the, the language is a little ambiguous. 
Uh, we don't know what a, what a definition of substantial increase is, but there is qualifying language here that, that does reference compared to the required reduction level. So when you're comparing your plan against the reduction levels, the, the substantial increase is compared to the, to the reduction levels in the rule. Um, I, I think my, my recommendation would be to not, not get rid of the substantial increase language because the substantial language, because if you're talking about any increase in greenhouse gas emissions for, then you will, you, you, there may be a really, really, and I'm not saying there is, but there could be a really, really important project that, that by itself might increase greenhouse gas emissions, but it addresses such an important regional priority um, that you would want to seek a waiver for it. And if, if we took out substantial and just left increase in greenhouse gas emissions, um, you would never be able to, to do one of those, get a waiver from the commission. And again, the commission's the backstop here for that, for that, for that waiver. They, they still have the discretion on whether to grant the request or not. Well, I guess my response to that would be that um, if that's the case, it's it's a really important safety project um, that increases greenhouse gas emissions, then there ought to be a mitigation, a package of mitigation measures to offset it. Uh, you know, we, we need to be we need to be doing everything we can to meet these these reduction targets. Uh, I don't know whether substantial, you know, to me, substantial might be um, something that results in a 30% uh, increase relative to the reduction level. To somebody else, it might be 60%. Uh, it's, and I, I think substantial is just too vague a word. And the Transportation Commission is gonna need guidance. So is uh, they're gonna be just as much adrift. So I think that either needs to be defined um, it, or, we need to take it out because again, because there are ways in which to um, get to neutral. Uh, that's the purpose of in allowing mitigation measures. Thanks, Director Levy. Um, so the first uh, comment that you added, it was not clear to me if you wanted to leave that on the table um, or not. Well, I think I'll, I'll take it off the table. I think it needs more work. Okay, and the second you are leaving on. Strikes yes. Thank yeah. you. Um, I just, uh, I did try to write something up um, if you wanted to hear about it um, on mitigation measures. Oh, for please. Just, um, yeah. So I wrote, if an MPO does not attain their target, the state shall provide additional funding equal to 25% of the MPO's mitigation measures to be spent on additional mitigation measures in disproportionately impacted communities. So like, the, so I was trying to capture what you, the concept you were saying is that like, we need to be putting more funding to disproportionately impact communities. So projects will be submitting, um, you know, mitigation measures for their project. And if with all these mitigation measures, we still don't meet our target, then the state shall provide additional funding that would be equal to the cost of 25% of the mitigation measures to be spent entirely in disproportionately impacted communities. So you would be bringing more um, money to be able to address uh, the impacts and you direct them toward disproportionately impacted communities. Yeah, um, um, I think that works. I, I, uh, I, I got a lifeline here from a friend that suggested uh, 8.02.3 language um, where such impact or benefit affects a disproportionately impacted community um, that consideration shall take precedence over others. I'm not, um, I think, well. I think going, sorry, I, I didn't mean to derail us. So it's eight, five thirty eight. Um, and so we are yeah. over. Um, so I think we'll call it good with your number two suggestion and recognize we need to continue to work on the other. Um, I, three hands came up while you were talking and they may have been in response. Um, and I completely understand wanting to have a full debate and um, things like that. But if we could just stick to if there are any new amendments to add um, to the plan. Um, and then like we did on the first set that we were able to unanimously agree on and get in there. Um, 
just keep your hands up for those. And if they're in response to anything that's been said, please just hold those until we get to the voting section. And so the hands that are still up are people that have additional amendments, uh, either subtractions or additions they would like to add to the letter. Director Shaw. Thank you, yes. Um, uh, if Director Rex might put the uh, measure that will also be proposed by the RAC, it's probably worth um, um, you know, presenting it to this board as well, that uh, because Front Range and Dr. Cog are presented with higher targets that perhaps they could also have proportionally higher uh, funds allocated uh, for, for mitigation. Madam Chair. Um, sorry, I, one thing that is very hard is when there's like a big set of chat and texts and the content. So I apologize for not calling <laughs> Director Rex. Madam Chair, thank you very much. Uh, Director Stuff, thank you for your question. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the specific language Oh, okay. um, that was used at the Regional Air Quality Council because the comments have not been developed yet. It was basically okay. um, one of the assumptions, I think you laid it out very well, that um, because of the, the issues and concerns of greenhouse gas emissions within our region, which is the majority of the, of the state with regards to the need for reductions, um, that a proportionate share of funding should also, so also be allocated to this region and the North Front Range region to, to offset those. So that was basically the the tenor of the comment that will be included in RAC's comments um, as part of this rulemaking. Thank you. Great, and it would be nice if this board could it could vote on that also. I had one comment that might uh, perhaps help us get through um, some of Director Levy's uh, two points. Um, one has been withdrawn, I understand, but. This is very early in the process and to start to tie our hands to such a large degree may not be our wisest choice, even if I think the direction she's headed may be a good one. Um, I, think, I think both of those uh, defining significant, uh, for example, might really be appropriate to come later, but I think there needs to be something more than, uh, than any increase. Um, that seems problematic in terms of this stage of the rulemaking. But um, so anyway, those, those are my comments and thank you. Thanks, Director Shaw. So I just want to call time out. So I let things get out of order and disarray. So I apologize for that. Um, sometimes when the best of intentions lead to craziness. So I apologize. And so just to clarify for everyone, there's only one additional proposal, uh, proposed change on the table right now. So let's just go ahead and discuss and vote on that. And then if there are any other new ones, um, we can have any discussion on that. That way we clarify that there's not a lot to discuss. So the only proposal that there is right now is to strike the word substantial from 8.05.2.1.2. And I got uh, a lot of text messages from you all and messages and chats. And so uh, if there are any dissenting uh, perspectives that would like to comment on that, uh, please raise your hand to provide your comments. Director Mulvey. Yes, um, I would submit that if we are going to remove substantial, then it becomes too broad and we should have an alternative word to be more definitional. It's equally undefined if the word isn't there at all, because then it could be just 1%. So perhaps what um, Director Levy would be suggesting is a word like moderate. Thank you, Director Mulvey. Director Odoricio. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, I think that that striking anything on this right now in relation to substantial would uh, create a situation where we're, we're raising the bar to the point where we think it might be well-intentioned, but it could be draconian in nature. I mean, if we're gonna succeed in trying to reduce greenhouse gases, what we really need to do is make sure that this, that any policy that comes out of this is inclusive where all communities can participate. And while I appreciate like 
the, the thought that maybe maybe that we want to stop all greenhouse gas and increases in every single project. I appreciate, I think, where the intention is in that, but there are a lot of communities on in Dr. Cog that are continuing to still grow that still need to address issues like safety and other issues that are related. And, and, it, and it feels like sometimes where just because Denver and Boulder are done growing doesn't mean the rest of us need to stop. And I think what we need to do is if we're going to really address greenhouse gases and address climate change, we need to do it where we're as inclusive as possible with as many different jurisdictions participating. The more flexibility we have to allow folks to participate and make a dent in this, the better off we are. I'm just afraid that by, by, by removing things like substantial, we're making it way too draconian and we're gonna uh, set ourselves up for division and failure. And that's not how we're gonna succeed if we wanna really address this stuff uh, substantially. Uh, no pun intended with the substantial, thanks. Thank you, Director Odorizio. Director Teal. Thank you, Madam Chair. I mean, I, I do have an appreciation, Claire, for where you're trying to go with uh, trying to strike a definition there. My only problem is um, I, I'm still not sure we're dealing with proven math here. And so um, when we talk about making these calculations, you know, we could have what is essentially a rounding error that results in a point zero 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 pick a number for the you know measurement of metric tons um, it, that then you know would disqualify uh, a project um, based upon um, kind of unproven unused mathematical calculations whereas leaving substantial in there does allow for um, I hate to say a fudge factor with the math but it allows for that to evolve and those calculation methods that are being discussed to try to qualify uh, the impact on greenhouse gas emissions, um, it allows for that, that those calculations to evolve and be taken into account. So I, um, I, I speak uh, opposed to the motion and I am in favor of keeping substantial in place. Thank you, ma'am. Any folks wanna speak in favor of the motion? Um, Dr. Dr. May, may I? Yeah, thank, thank you, uh, Chair Stolzman. So um, to be clear, um, Boulder County is not done growing um, and I represent Boulder County. Um, and uh, this is, uh, I, none of this is intended, none, none of the, the rule, none, no aspect of this planning is intended to stifle growth. Um, it's intended to um, assure that what growth occurs and the transportation necessary to serve that growth uh, does not increase greenhouse gas emissions and um, hence the availability of mitigation measures. Um, it, you know, there can be major new arterials in Adams County to serve a growing population, but there needs to be multimodal transportation options, um, perhaps um, Adams County might consider land use regulations that would have more compact growth so that to better facilitate um, uh, bike ped transportation, et cetera. So it's, it's, uh, none of this would, would um, uh, eliminate an, a community's ability to grow. Uh, I, um, I, I hear your point, Director Teal. Um, I, it could say, I mean, we it could go one direction to say if it results in more than a de minimis increase um, I or I, I think something that might be more palatable to the group because I'm, I'm getting the drift of it of uh, something more like if such waiver results in a more than insignificant increase I, and I realize these are none of these are precise terms we're not going to have a mathematical um, term here, um, but you know, substantial. When we're looking at the greenhouse, uh, the required reduction levels being, I'm trying to get back to that page. Um, um, 0.27 million metric tons. Um, I don't know what that is. I, I just don't know what that is. And I think 
uh, and, all, and all of this is, it assumes, um, oh, I need to have more, two more screens open, but um, uh, you know, we, we need to be serious about this. So I'm looking for another word. Um, if de minimis is, is, is too minor, I would say then it, if it results in a more than um, insignificant increase. In no case shall a waiver be granted if such waiver results in a more than insignificant increase. But I see Director Brockett might have some ideas. Thank you, Director Levy. So just a time check for everybody. It's 5.50. We are 20 minutes into the next meeting that was supposed to start. So just wanted to remind you of all of that. Um, but we really do uh, need to get through this tonight. So we're carrying on until we finish. Um, and that is a direct threat to everyone. We'll be here until we're done. <laughs> but just so you know, we are running into the next meeting already. Director Brockett. We're stuck here in uh, no dinner until we finish, right? No um, dessert until you finish your piece. Right. So just what, one thought. I, I wonder if rather than uh, suggesting a wordsmith to this item, if instead we requested that substantial be defined to make sure that um, that, that only um, that, that projects they would only allow through projects with a, a very small impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions, because so, we're I think we're struggling because nobody nobody has any math in front of us and so it's all vague and undefined. So what if we asked for clarity to to accomplish Claire's fundamental goal? Director Shaw, as I understand it. Thank you. Yes, I, I guess what I was going to say is that if, if it's only a rounding error or something insignificant, then we wouldn't really need the waiver process. So there may be, again, a safety project or, or something. Um, I would be more inclined to uh, keep substantial here, but, but try and clarify, as Director Brockett had said, what is the meaning of su substantial? And I think that could evolve as the document evolves. Thanks, Director Shaw. So we have hands in the queue that are people who have spoken on this topic. So if there's anybody who has not spoken on this topic before we vote, go ahead and let us know now. All right, Director Teal, you're the last person to speak before the vote, Director Teal. Yeah, uh, again, I, I would encourage, uh, I, I'll speak against the motion once again. It, um, again, Director Levy, I, I get what you're trying to do and, and, and I do have a degree of respect for it. The only problem is we're not in an effort to sharpen the pencil in using a different word than substantial. It doesn't appear that we're getting a more specific phrase to be applied. Um, therefore, I would speak against the motion and encourage us to keep substantial in place, although vague, it is uh, it, it, it is um, definitely something that I believe the commission when reviewing these waivers, it should stand out of what is substantial versus insubstantial when considering the waivers at the time that they come, come forward uh, to be considered. I speak against the motion. Thanks, Director Teal. And to be fair, I'll let Director Levy respond, but um, we really do need to take a vote if we're going to get through this. Director Levy. Yeah, and I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna help out here and, and withdraw the motion and suggest that our letter request that um, the Transportation mm -hmm. Commission develop a guidance document that would provide uh, some um, um, provide some guidance on um, how to interpret that word. All right, um, so Director Levy is modifying the, the amendment to add uh, a bullet. Uh, again, this will be written grammatically correctly by staff after the fact that would request that the Transportation Commission develop a guidance document to clarify the meaning of the word substantial in this context. Is that correct, Director Levy? Is there any what is there any question about what we're voting on now? Director Odoricia. Director Levy, I appreciate that. I think always asking for clarification is always a good compromise for all of us. It helps provide clarity and, and, and really find out what we need to hone in on is if there is any uh, perceived or real uh, discrepancies in our positions. Because 
I don't feel like a lot of us are that far off. Uh, I just want to make sure that we are flexible and inclusive. You saw that in the comments, but we really have to pull the whole team together on this if we're going to really address greenhouse gas uh, production. So thank you very much, uh, Director Levy. Director Starker? I did have a thank you. I did have a question. Are we then uh, not voting on the word substantial, but voting on what sounds to be a slightly substitute motion? Yeah, so I've struck it on my paper. We're not voting on the removing the word substantial anymore. That's been removed. So the new amendment that's proposed is to add language to our draft letter that would request the Transportation Commission develop a guidance document to clarify what substantial means in this context. And again, it's not the exact wording that I've read aloud is not important. The staff understands the context of the conversation and they'll make it proper. Director Starker, is there any other comment you wanted to make? Uh, no, thank you. That addresses my issue. All right, so is everyone clear what we're voting on? All right, seeing no confusion, um, please raise your hand if you're in favor of adding the statement. Um, it is still a majority of uh, members present and voting, uh, not as favorable as the previous ones. If anyone, so please lower your hands. If there's anyone opposed, please raise your hand. And um, if you wanted to make comments, you're welcome to. Um, all right, so that carries as well. Um, so seeing no other comments from members, I'll just summarize that we are uh, going to now take a final vote and I would encourage a unanimous vote because this is one of those things that you may not agree with everything in the letter or every single point, but this is one of those things when we speak as a region, uh, it carries much more weight. Um, and so if this is a very important document staff have worked on to make this rule implementable uh, and meaningful to our region. And so um, they've written a great letter for us. We're, we're proposing a few amendments that we've voted on and majority supported all of them, which included replacing the word other with all on page two of the letter in the underlined section referring to 8.02.1. .02, 8 uh, we've agreed to uh, ask CDOT to include all NPOs in CDOT in the 2025 year uh, target in the table one target. We've included a language to encourage CDOT to increase transparency during the consultation process so that the models can be understood by interested parties and that the model captures induced demand. And we're going to include a statement to request that the Transportation Commission develop a guidance document to clarify what substantial means in the context uh, that was brought up by Director Levy. So it's the draft letter, um, and then uh, we'll have the appendices uh, that were included for us to the TC as well. So like the red line and the uh, red line uh, appended to the draft with all of those amendments that we've previously voted on. So I will move that we adopt everything that I just talked about. And is there a second? Second. Thank you. And so now discussion on the motion, Director Brockett. I was just gonna move, move the motion. Oh. Thank you, Director Brockett uh, and Director Shaw. Same thing? Yes. Thank you both. Um, is there any discussion of the motion from folks? Any confusion as to what we're voting on? All right. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any, any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Uh, the motion passes unanimously. I appreciate all the hard work uh, that all of you put into this, that all of your staffs put into this, that all of the community members who have testified on behalf of this um, and CDOT staff, um, I'm sure I've left people out and just there's been a tremendous amount of work. So thank you to everybody. Um, Ron and his team, of course, uh, are owed a great deal of thanks. And so with that, that takes us to our administrative items. Our next meeting is October 20th. And are there any other matters by members? All right. Madam Chair. Um, yep, yeah, just one quick reminder from me is just uh, at the beginning, I reminded everyone about their executive director evaluation. So just a re-plug on that. And then executive director Rex. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm looking at uh, Chair Conklin forms an engagement committee meeting. Let's convene that. It's now six o'clock. Let's convene that at 6.05. That sound good, Steve? Okay. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your patience. All right. Thank you, everybody. We're adjourned. See you next time. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.